Hey, thanks for joining me on this journey through the servant songs. This week we're looking at the last of the four servant songs, which means that's the fourth one. <laughs> um, and it is the most significant of it's what all the other three have been leading up to, and you get to why this suffering is taking place and what's the purpose of it all. We get that in this uh, interesting fourth servant song. It actually begins in chapter 52 and goes through chapter 53 through verse 12. And it's broken into uh, stanzas, five stanzas, three verses a piece in those five stanzas. And uh, 13, 14, 15 of chapter 52, and then you go into chapter 53, verses 1, 2, and 3, and then 4, 5, and 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 10, 11, 12, and that's how that works out, and they lead into each other. So we're going to look at, because there are five of them, and I only do four days in a week of video, because Fridays I'm usually tied up doing other stuff, um, we, will, we will look at two of those stanzas today, and that's okay because they basically are uh, saying the same thing just different groups of people saying it. There are two different groups of people that are uh, that are pictured or are in view uh, in the last part of chapter 52 and the first part of chapter 53. In the last part of chapter 52, it is the nations, the Gentile nations, uh, that are shocked um, at the weakness and lowliness of the servant. And in the beginning of 53, verses 1, 2, and 3, it is Israel and the prophet speaking for Israel that is shocked uh, and pays no attention to the servant because they are expecting the arm of God, the deliverer, and, and it, it's not what they expected. So those two different groups of people, and it, dealing with the same thing, this dismay or this shock and utter despising in, in the Hebrew sense, not paying attention to, this weak so-called deliverer? Okay, so that's really the issue in these first six verses that we're looking at. So let's dive into it. Um, we're going to look at uh, verses 13, 14, and 15 of Isaiah 52 first. Behold my servant, behold my servant, and this is the way the New American Standard translates it, I have some quibble with it, will prosper. It's okay if you understand what prosper means. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle or startle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him, for what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. Okay, let's stop right there. Obviously, this is talking about Gentile kings, Gentile nations, Gentile people who have not heard of the arm of the Lord, because that's what is proceeding in the, in the chapters preceding this in Isaiah, over and over God has said, and certainly in what is proceeding in Isaiah 52, is that God would certainly deliver his people, that the arm of the Lord for deliverance is going to be revealed, and he himself is going to rescue them. Uh, and it's very messianic, uh, that the deliverer would come and rescue them. And, and so the nations have not heard of this. The, the nations don't want anything about some deliverer or the arm of the Lord uh, that, that is strong to deliver. And so they have not heard uh, of this, and, uh, and what they had not seen and what they had not heard, they will see and they will understand. They will see that this is the arm of the Lord. They will see that this is how um, even not only Israel, but the nations are rescued as well. So let's look at this from the beginning. Behold, and there, there again, that goes back, harkens back to the very first servant song in Isaiah 42 that says, Behold, my servant. Uh, here again, behold. Uh, Neset, behold, pay attention to, and you're supposed to, the word itself means to pay attention to the one who is being introduced, the one who's being revealed, if you want to look at it that way. Pay attention to this, and if he is the deliverer, if he is the actual, the revealed arm of God to rescue and deliver Israel and the nations to bring salvation uh, and bring people into that relationship with God by defeating sin and the consequences of it, then by all means, we need to pay attention to this, to this servant. The servant will prosper, and that the word in Hebrew there has to do with wisdom and right action. Um, it is doing the right thing based upon the knowledge that one has, and it, it means that 
uh, in no way will the servant not accomplish his mission. It means that he will prosper. His prosperity is based on the accomplishing of that mission, and that's what it means. It doesn't mean he's going to get wealthy uh, or, or anything like that. His prosperity is based in doing what he was called to do and what was set before him as the servant of, of Yahweh, of the Lord, and to accomplish that. And so there was no way that he's going to fail in spite of everything that's going to be said about him through, through this. Uh, he will not fail. He will be high and lifted up. A very interesting phrase because that phrase or those words used together like that in, in the Hebrew only takes place in four places in the book of Isaiah and nowhere else in the Old Testament. One is here. Of the other three uses in Isaiah, again, the only place that it's used in the Old Testament, is for God, for Yahweh. And so it makes you have to ask, okay, can this servant be Israel? No, because Israel is not going to be elevated um, to the place of God. Could this be a prophet? No, because no prophet is exalted to the place of God. And so there's only, it raises the question, just who, who, is, this, uh, who is this servant then? Uh, if he is exalted to the place of God, if he's high and lifted up like that, and it takes the position of God. Well, for the Christian, and, and certainly for me, that is none other than Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, uh, who is the, the Son of God, the, the very fleshed out form of uh, the second person of the Trinity. So, of course, uh, there's a little cue as to who the servant is when he arrives in the New Testament and greatly exalted, exalted highly. Um, only God would be in that place. And God says he will not give his place to another. Uh, so to his son, yes. Um, just as many were astonished, uh, shocked uh, at you, many, the peoples. So his appearance was marred more than any man. His form more than the sons of men. Not to be human. Now, as many commentators have said, does that mean that he was really ugly and grotesque and all of that, that this servant is ugly? No, what it means is um, he is ignored. He is not the kind of leader. He is acquainted with suffering and grief and all of that, but he's not the kind of leader, this deliverer, this savior, is not the kind of leader that the world would expect. He's not someone who is charismatic. He's not someone uh, who is going to draw people to them. He's not uh, dressed in finery. He's not in any of this. He's not the trappings of a charismatic leader is not with him. He's just not someone that you're going to look to and think, oh yeah, that guy's a leader. It's just not going to happen. Uh, his appearance marred more than his performance on him. Unless you take that, his appearance being marred on the cross, his appearance being marred. But I don't think so because we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't got to that point in uh, Isaiah 53 where, where that talks about that. I think it's more a, uh, an amalgamation here, the idea of acquainted with sufferings, acquainted with grief, acquaint, acquainted with, uh, there's nothing special about him that you would take notice. Um, nothing that would, he's not the kind of leader that you would take notice of. He's not that charismatic guy that if you get in his way, he's just going to crush you uh, and that kind of thing. This, this whole thing of humility and suffering uh, for others and losing in order to win, that makes no sense to the Gentile world. And it just is not, that's not even the way humans work. And they're right. It's not the way we work. Because uh, we do so by trampling over people and climbing over people and getting rid of people uh, to get our way and cheating and lying and, and doing whatever it takes uh, to... to be out in front. And so thus, because he's not like that, he will startle. It says sprinkle here in in the New American Standard. And here I'm going to take issue with it because uh, I would translate it startle uh, because I think it's more in fitting. The sprinkle doesn't doesn't work. He will sprinkle many nations. King will shut their mouths on account of him. I, does he, in fact, if you think of sprinkle in the sense of sprinkle of them with the blood, with hyssop, and that could cleanse many nations, it has no meaning for the nations, has meaning for Israel, but none for the nations. I think the, the better word, and it can be translated startle, shock, uh, will startle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths on account of him. The people in the, in the Gentile world just won't get it. And Paul says the very same thing when he talks about 
uh, that this the, the cross is a scandal uh, to the Jew and a stumbling block uh, for the Gentile. Uh, scandalous for the Jew because cursed is he who hangs on a tree. Um, a stumbling block for Gentile because this is just not how leadership works. This is just not how the whole thing, you're supposed to have might. You're supposed to be mighty and, and overcome and conquer, and that's not how he operates. And so he's going to startle uh, the kings and the nations, and they will shut their mouths for what they had not been told because they had never seen this. They had no idea of the arm of the Lord and any of this suffering on behalf. It makes no sense to them, and so their mouths are shut. They don't know what to say about this. And then it moves into, and people still don't know what to say about it. Suffering, like that makes no sense to become last in order to be first, to serve and to be a leader by serving. It makes no sense to the world. Uh, but that is how Christianity functions. That is how we function following the Lord Jesus Christ, is that we um, take a back seat. We serve others. We serve one another. Uh, and we don't, uh, and and. That is how we become first in the kingdom, is by being last. And we follow Jesus in that pattern of leadership and, and service and in love for others. But it makes no sense to the world. Still makes no sense to the world. Uh, it, it only makes sense to believers, and sometimes not to believers. Anyway, in these the next stanza, 53, 1 through 3, uh, it's speaking of the Hebrew people, Israel. And you can tell that who has believed our message and to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed. And whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That is Israel. Israel is expecting the arm of the Lord to deliver them. Um, Israel has heard this, and who would have believed it? Who would have believed this message? Who would have who who would have thought that when the arm of the Lord the Lord is revealed to deliver Israel and the nations, that it would look like this? That it would look like someone who is weak and lowly and pitiful. Listen to what it says about him. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot. That means like a, a, a sucker coming off of, I have crepe myrtles in my yard. And if you have crepe myrtles and you have roots are exposed and you, and you, and you trim your crepe myrtles, the suckers will come up off of those roots. Uh, and you have to snip those things off. And they're very tender. You can break them off with your hand. You can, it's very tender. And that's what he's talking about. Uh, this is just not even a, a, a tree. It's just a sucker coming off of a root. Um, and like a, a root out of parched ground, like a little shoot that's trying to grow in, in unwatered ground. It is, will, he, will it even survive? That's the question. So weak, so lowly. Uh, no stately form of majesty that we should look upon him, nor, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. So there's nothing that, that would draw us to him as a leader, nothing that would draw us to him as the arm of God for deliverance, nothing that would do that. And of course we can't help but think of the lowly birth of Jesus in a, in a in a in a in a, in a barn or a cave where animals are kept uh, and laid in an animal feeding trough and the poverty of the family uh, nothing nothing that would make you think oh the majesty to bow before you the, the kings come the kings the 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 magi coming uh, at the birth of Christ or later sometime after the birth of Christ uh, and bow down and worship them it makes no sense. To Israel makes no sense. Who are these people coming? There's nothing about this child, nothing about him that would draw us to him. No majesty, no stately appearance, nothing about him. Um, just weak, uh, lowly conditioned. Just who, who, who? How could this be the arm of the Lord to deliver? Uh, good question. He was despised and forsaken of men. It's speaking of Israel. Israel is despised and forsaking him. Man of sorrows is acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Uh, he's, he's so lowly, so weak, so, so unattractive. People don't even want to associate with him. I don't want to be around that guy. And that word despise uh, that is used there, in the Hebrew mind, that doesn't mean, in the English it has an emotion that's attached with it, that hatred and ugh. Um, and, and not the case in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the idea is... Um, not to pay attention to. Uh, it's just, eh, ignore that. It's not even worth paying attention to. Uh, and so it's just uh, unnoticed and forsaken by men. Just, eh, nothing. So it's nothing emotional about it. It's just nothing worth noting about. He's so, that's a weak character. He just, he just can't even deliver anybody. How's he going to deliver 
the Israel from sin and bondage. How, how's, how's he going to deliver anybody? He's a man of sorrows and grief. And again, we don't pay attention to him and we don't even think him worth paying attention to. That's the estimation of both the world, the nations, and Israel regarding the Lord's servant. And the whole idea is this one who who suffers the loss of everything, but by doing so conquers everything, is anathema to Israel and just ridiculous to the nations. And that is why they don't understand. That is why. How can someone this lowly deliver anyone? How can someone this weak be a king? How can someone like this save anyone, much less the nations, much less Israel, the world? How is that going to happen? Well, we know that he does through the death on the cross and that the powers are defeated by his losing everything Everything else is conquered and bows before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it's all based in the love of Yahweh who wants to draw all people to himself to, to give us the victory over sin and death. Hey, listen, I pray that you know that. We're going to dive into some more of this tomorrow. And it gets um, more uh, into the purpose of the suffering and how God is going to deliver through this one who is so weak and through this one who is humble and through this one who has no majesty or stately appearance. We'll find out how he does that as we go through this servant song, which is supposed to get us ready for Advent, the celebration of the birth of our Savior. All right, so as we're uh, moving through this, I pray that you'll fall in love all over again with Jesus Christ, who is the servant of, of Yahweh. And look at the clues that he is Yahweh, that he is God Almighty. Uh, and, and we can see all that because he is high and lifted up. And that you will know the love of God through faith in Jesus Christ, the servant of Yahweh who saves us and rescues us, who turns out to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. I pray you know him as Savior and you've bowed before him as Lord because there you find the love of God on display. And, and there is the only place you can have the love of God poured into you is through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, then you know that he came so that we might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here, right now, not later, right here and right now. And I pray that you know that because if you do, then you have the peace of God, which comes through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, that shalom, that wholeness, that everything is working out according to God's plan. And we can rest easy knowing that God is with us and he's working all things out for his purposes and for our good. Pray that you know that. Hey, listen, I pray that God's peace rests upon you always. Till we meet again tomorrow. Shalom, my friend.